This story is about a man named Kenneth Supreme McGriff, who hired a group of hitmen. Today we're going to talk about the lives of those hitmen and who they are and how they were brought together to perform a hit on e-money bags in front of the house of Tupac's right hand man, Stretch. The case remained unsolved until a key piece of evidence was found in a separate case in a different state. This is the story of E. Money Bags. E. Money is a Brooklyn gangster that moved to Lefrak City, Queens, New York in the early 1990s. He was living the life of a stick-up kid and a thug that used his firearm to solve his problems. It's a small world and everyone in New York that's about that life knows everyone else that's on the same type of time. So people knew of E Money Bags. He was connected to Nas and Mob Deep from Queensbridge, Capone and Noriega from Left Rack, and Live Squad from Shadyville, Queens. Through six degrees of separation, he could get in contact with anybody that was somebody. Being around all these other men that was getting money in the rap game inspired him to stop living the life of crime and start rapping. He was rocking with the Queens rappers and they were rocking with him. So when E Money had an issue with Jay Z, this caused an issue with Queens rappers like Nas and Mob Deep. Let's take it back to 1990. Six years before Mob Deep released a song named Godfather Part 3, a movie by the same name premiered December 25th, 1990. During the Christmas premiere of the movie, E-Money was involved in a shooting at the Green Acres Mall Theater in Valley Stream, Long Island. He was one of the shooters when an argument between two groups of men erupted, when one group was accused of making too much noise. After the gun smoke cleared, four people were hit, and all four victims were innocent bystanders. Police retrieved 25 shells from five different firearms that night. A 15-year-old high school student named Tremaine Hall from Hollis, Queens, passed away as he was struck in the head. Marco and Patrice Candelaria from Island Park were also hit. Marco was hit in the arm and Patrice had surgery to have the slug removed from her neck. Terrain Haynes, a 17-year-old from Woodside, Queens, who played basketball for Forest Hill High School, lost an eye. While the innocent victims' lives changed forever, E-Money would go on with his life and build relationships with some of Queens' finest. He was in the mix. In November 1994, shooters approached his friend Stretch and Tupac outside Quad Studios in New York City. Tupac would end up getting hit five times, but survived. A year later in November 1995, Stretch became a victim of homicide in Queens Village when men in a vehicle pulled up next to his green Mazda MPV and unloaded. In 1996, Tupac would get hit again, but this time he didn't make it. He passed away. After Biggie got hit and also passed away in 1997, the crown for New York MCs 100% belonged to Nas and Jay Z. In 1999, E Money would put out his first and only album, and in that same year, an issue between him and a gangster would escalate. That gangster was a man named Kenneth Supreme McGriff. Born in 1960, Supreme wasn't just anybody. He was a drug kingpin who served 12 years in prison for running one of New York's most sophisticated and violent drug gangs of the 1980s. In 1987, Supreme was arrested following a federal investigation and in 89, pled guilty to engaging in a continuing criminal enterprise. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison but was released on parole in early 1994 after serving approximately seven years of his sentence. He was sent back to prison on parole violations and served another two and a half before being released in 1997. It was said the dispute between E-Money and Supreme was the result of an ongoing money issue. So on a winter day in December 1999 at the Coliseum Shopping Center in Jamaica, Queens, Supreme and his right hand man, Black Just, was making moves and was posted up in a vehicle. E-Money just happened to be on site that same day at the same time. He saw Supreme, pulled out his firearm, and unloaded. Although Supreme was the intended target, he was unharmed and survived. But his man Black Just didn't. He was hit in the leg. 
It is said that Supreme was worried about his connection to a shooting and other reasons besides violating his parole and waited too long to get Black Just to the hospital. The long wait resulted in Just losing too much blood and he would later pass away due to his injuries. In the year 2000, an event at radio station Hot 97 stirred up an already ongoing issue. Jay-Z and Memphis Bleak introduced an artist by the name of H. Moneybags during a live freestyle. E. Moneybags obviously looked at it as disrespect that a guy would use a name similar to his, especially since him and Jay-Z went to the same high school and Jay knew E. Money was a gangster and wasn't having it. E. Money called the radio station and had a verbal confrontation with Jay and it didn't go well. This situation added flames to the fire between the Queen's MCs that supported E-Money and the Brooklyn MC, Jay-Z. The Art of Revenge The death of Black Just couldn't go unpunished, and the punishment would be street justice in the form of slugs. This brings us to the team of hitmen that was hired for that revenge. Let's talk about a man named Emmanuel. Emmanuel was born in 1971 and grew up in Harlem with his mother, stepfather, brother, and two sisters. In the 10th grade, or about 13 years old, he dropped out of high school and started off as a small-time drug dealer. In 1987, at 16 years old, Emmanuel and friends was traveling in a taxi cab. That taxi cab was pulled over and he was arrested for a firearm. Two years later, at 18 years old, he started moving around and began selling drugs out of town in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Harrisburg provided an opportunity as he could make more money out there compared to his hometown in Harlem, New York. It was simple. He could charge more for the same thing out in Pennsylvania. Emmanuel was a small-time dealer as he was selling product with street-level clientele. His hustle started to pick up and he recruited some friends to help out. He would spend the next four years hustling in Pennsylvania, back and forth to New York, clearing about 25 grand every two weeks. In 1989, at 18 years old, while making a purchase to re-up, he was arrested in New York City and decided to skip out on court and went back to the hustle in Harrisburg. While getting to the money, he met another hustler from New York named Barry. Over time, they became close. One evening, Barry went outside and got into a shootout where he emptied his firearm and took the life of another man. Barry was arrested and charged with homicide. When in Pennsylvania, Emmanuel would stay at his baby mother's house while he was hustling. One week he left Pennsylvania to do business in New York, and while he was in New York, his girl's house in Pennsylvania was raided and drugs was found. To avoid taking responsibility for the drugs, he stayed in New York. In 1992, at 20 years old, Emmanuel was arrested in Harlem for conspiracy to sell drugs in Pennsylvania. He was taken to Metropolitan Correctional Center, then extradited to Pennsylvania, where he was charged with continuing a criminal enterprise. He was facing 20 years in prison and made a decision to do what criminals do. He signed an agreement and cooperated with law enforcement, which reduced his time from 20 years to 7 years. In October 1998, at 27 years old, he was released from prison and went back to Harlem where he worked as a personal trainer at the New York Sports Club. He did that for about two years, but the money kept calling him and he got back to the hustle. By this time, his old friend Barry completed his sentence for the homicide in Pennsylvania and was now a free man. They met up for the first time at 144th Street and 8th Avenue in Harlem. At their first meeting, Barry asked for a firearm and Emmanuel gave him one. At that point, Emmanuel met a man named Supreme. He met him through a mutual friend named Wayne Davis. Barry met Supreme while Supreme was on set for the filming of a movie named Crime Partners. Supreme bought the rights of that book from Bentley Morris for $135,000 and the movie starred Tyron Turner, Ice-T, Snoop Dogg and others. Emmanuel didn't yet know Supreme, but he knew of him. What did he know? He knew Supreme was a boss, about that life, a leader of a violent criminal enterprise called the Supreme Team. Next time he saw Supreme was two months later at Broadway and 51st Street at a club named Mars 2112. 
Emmanuel stated that while at the club, Supreme asked him to put in some work for him. Emmanuel took it to mean that he needed him to commit homicide. The night ended and the next day Emmanuel went to work. He reached out to his man, Russell Allen, and Russell reached out to his man, Alvin Smiley. Who is Alvin Smiley? Alvin grew up and lived with his mother, two sisters, and two brothers in the neighborhood of 155th Street and 8th Avenue in Harlem, New York, which is about 15 minutes away from the world-famous Apollo Theater. At 15 years old, while he was halfway through the 10th grade, he dropped out of high school so he could further his drug dealing career. He sold hard drugs for a man named Marlon, and after hundreds of sales, he would later sell drugs to an undercover officer, and at age 16, he would experience his first arrest as a juvenile. As he was addicted to smoking marijuana, he was admitted into a drug rehabilitation program, and upon his release, he went back to Harlem to continue to do what he knew best sell drugs. He would then get arrested again for the same thing, and in 1996, Alvin would be a part of an event that would change him forever. On a nice summer day, a boy tried to steal his bicycle, and as he struggled, the boy pulled out a firearm. Alvin was not scared and insisted that he's not giving up his bike. He wrestled the bike away from the gunman, went home, and came back with a 12-gauge shotgun. Alvin located the gunman and chased him into a local video game arcade and after searching for him, Alvin found him hiding in a corner and pulled out the 12 gauge and threatened his life. The gunman was scared for his life and apologized for what he did. Alvin accepted his apology, turned around and was about to leave. At that moment, the gunman pursued Alvin and Alvin turned around and fired, hitting him in the chest. This is the story of Kenneth Suprema Griff and the hitmen involved in the homicide of E Moneybags. If you enjoyed this content, give it a thumbs up and click on the next episode from Big City Crime TV.